Demi tells the story of Cody Heller, played by Anna Kendrick, who in the show is a struggling female writer in Hollywood dating a much more successful male writer. And in the show, Dan has a sex doll, which Cody becomes jealous of, and then the sex doll starts talking to her. The sex doll and Cody have this sort of antagonistic relationship, but they also become writing partners. We were Quibi's first scripted show to go into production, actually. Essentially, Quibi stands for Quick Bites, which means that all of their shows, the episodes are 10 minutes or less in runtime. And the way the app works, it's literally that you flip your phone in real time and it switches between the versions. So your phone is constantly streaming these two versions simultaneously and they share the same soundtrack. We had to deliver the show in both 16 by nine and nine by 16. So you have two deliverables for the show. And I wanted to figure out a different way of doing that such when the viewer would flip the phone, it, you know, a two shot could stay a two shot and, you know, a medium close up could stay a medium close up. But it wasn't until I took on the job that I went in and they gave a sort of presentation to us about the way the app would work and their best practices, suggestions for how to shoot the show. I pitched to them this alternative idea, at which we wound up doing, which was essentially, we cropped a Sony Venice large format 6K sensor to a 4K square. So in other words, we kept the entire height of the sensor and cropped in horizontally so that it would have, you know, the same square dimensions. And then from there, we then framed 16 by nine and nine by 16 from within that square. So that both the 16 by nine and the nine by 16 had the same exact pixel dimensions. And essentially the subject size stayed a lot more consistent. I wanted to be looking at it in approximately the size that people would be watching the show on. So I had as well two seven inch monitors side by side, one for A camera, one for B camera. And then those monitors had the feed that was being generated so that I could see both frame lines. It's actually three frame lines because first you have the square and then you have the two. Because the height of the sensor was our limiting factor with the entire image, you know what I mean? The, the fact that it was the tallest sensor meant that we could have the, the most resolution and therefore we could also have the, you know, the, the widest field of view. And therefore we could also have the most shallow depth of field. For me, when I, you know, looked at it side by side with other cameras, it looked the way I wanted you know, the show to look. I think it's really important that, you know, we're making films or shows or whatever you want to call it, content that people can watch, that people are watching. And so for me, it was exciting to work in this new platform that was trying to reach this, you know, new audience. I'm definitely somebody who is always looking for an opportunity for physical humor, for what the camera can show or cannot show. And to be honest, like having the double framing, we played with that a lot. So there's a scene, for example, at the end of episode three, I remember on the day sort of making decisions about where we would put the vertical frame versus the horizontal frame that we thought, you know, oh, this could be sort of an added layer of humor. The vertical framing shows you really different parts of this sex doll's body that the repairman is sort of isolating out for the viewer. This is just sort of one example in the way that like to watch a Quibi show could be a more sort of interactive experience. This was the reason I wanted to shoot this show because the sort of levels of meta commentary that are going on, it was really intelligent. It was both funny, but also really dark and sad. So in episode five, the whole scene is basically Cody inside, coming out to the balcony, talking down to the doll, going back inside, coming out again, talking to the doll. But because it was all big one scene and it had this sort of flow, the director, Trisha Brack, said to me, you know, is there a way, can we shoot this so that it flows, so that, so that Anna gets to just say all the dialogue, walking from outside to inside to outside to inside, and we don't, you know, we're covering it from both directions. So we basically, we had we had a camera, a camera was um, on Steadicam inside the room and watch her sort of go out to the balcony. And then once she would come out on the balcony, then B camera was on a crane so that we could see 
or come out onto the balcony, you know, talking to the doll. And then we could turn around and, and shoot the doll. In the episode, it gets very sort of cut up, but you can still sort of see the, you know, the, the scope that we had to work with. You know, I think we approached it as if it was, you know, a, a feature film, to be honest, um, because the scripts were about, you know, that running length and, you know, and it's one arc and we had all of them up front and we block shot them. And, you know, so it was, it felt to me much more like shooting, um, like shooting a feature film. Three movies that uh, have stuck out to me as being, you know, well worth your time while in quarantine have been Dr. Zhivago. I, I, I rewatched Dr. Zhivago recently and thought, you know, it really holds up. It's an incredible, epic film, beautiful widescreen photography. I rewatched Big Night, which is quite the opposite kind of a film. It's this little indie movie from the 90s that Stanley Tucci made. It's so sweet, actually, and it's really, you know, it's a really nice sort of feel-good family foodie film. And the last thing I watched, which I thought was stunningly beautiful recently, was A Portrait of a Lady on Fire, which I loved. As a cinematographer, figuring out what to do creatively with your time can be challenging because you're so used to collaborating with others and working in a team. Taking still photographs is the, is the sort of, you know, single person art form version of that. Skills like composition and, you know, and, and, and lighting. Something else I've been doing while in quarantine because I'm stuck in one place literally for a long period of time is that you get to watch the way that the light changes over time in that one place. And that's, I think that's really interesting to do because, you know, it's already been seven weeks and I've seen, you know, the angle of light that comes into my bedroom at seven in the morning change and move. And it's like these long-term observations that you typically, you know, have no time to make. You're never in the same place to make them. I, I think the observation of light is a skill that you can cultivate and that you can learn how to apply, you know, when you're on set. And the BSC has been holding sort of these weekly webinar talks, which I've been tuning into, which I found really fascinating because they're not just, you know, it's not just one person, but it's a room full, Zoom, Zoom room full of people sort of, you know, all talking about similar things that we, you know, that we encounter on set, you know, that we have to deal with on projects and, um, and yeah, Lori Rose hosts them. They're really fascinating. Uh, so I would recommend checking that out. I think they have a YouTube channel for that.